uh, can start the registration. Marco, the floor is yours for the start of the conference. Okay, good morning to all. Thank you very much for attending this uh, uh, online press conference about, uh, about the launch of a petition to the European Parliament on voluntary assisted dying as a fundamental right, because 28 non-governmental organizations focusing on end-of-life decisions and civil liberties from across Europe have, have made the move uh, by deciding to join forces in a pan-European effort to reinforce the right to self-determination within the European Union. I will, uh, first of all, read out the proposal the proposals included in this uh, petition. First, the inclusion of the right to voluntary assisted dying in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Then uh, we ask for an EU legislation to enforce the individual rights to decide by what means and what point at what point their lives will end provided this person is capable of freely reaching a decision on this question and acting in consequence, which is considered by the European Court of Human Rights as, and I quote, one of the aspects of the right to respect the private life. In particular, proper professional assistance to end of life decisions should be provided in the European Union. And then, the mutual recognition of living will declarations and advances, the advanced directives within the European Union for those arrangements compatible with the law of the member states where the person is at the moment of need. And to this end, we ask for a European Union database uh, created in order to facilitate access to national living will depositories when needed in full compliance with the fundamental right to privacy. And last, the convening of uh, the a European Citizen Assembly by sortition to discuss and propose possible European measures to approach the issue of the right to die in a dignified way. Uh, well, um, this is the text of the petition. I'm convinced that uh, the European Union must uh, increasingly uh, become a space of freedom and fundamental rights. Uh, and on voluntary assisted dying, each member says, of course, must be able to legislate based on its own legal and administrative tradition, uh, particularly regarding the healthcare system, for example. But always respecting the principles recognized by the European Court of Human Rights, according to which every individual has, as it is quoted in the petition, the right to decide by what means and at what point their lives will end, provided this person is capable of reaching a decision. So, um, this is considered by the European Court of Human Rights as one of the aspects of the right to respect of private life. And this is why European organizations dealing with the issue have decided to join forces for a common initiative, addressing the European Parliament to demand that this freedom of choice be recognized in the fundamental charter of the human right. And uh, the other point, um, given that the European Union is also a space of free movement of people, it is crucial that it's also concerning the right to health in end-of-life choices. Uh, well, you remember during the COVID-19 pandemic, it was possible to create uh, a system of mutual recognition of much vaccination information. In a few weeks, you remember the Green Pass. This means that are, there are no technical obstacles to the mutual recognition of live will, living will, at least for those conforming to the law of the country where the sick person may find themselves in need of demanding respect for their own will. 
previously as expressed in the country of their citizenship. So today marks the beginning of the signature collection across the, the European Union. We will ask candidates for the European elections, regardless of their political orientation, to endorse this petition. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, somebody will uh, listen sooner or, or later in the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. And we now start our roundtable of endorsement about this uh, petition. So I will start by giving the floor to Heidemarie Hertel from the Austrian Society for a Human End of Life. And uh, Heidemarie, you can uh, tell us more uh, about the legal situation uh, of uh, euthanasia in your country, but also why you are supporting this uh, European petition. Heidi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lorenzo, and good morning. Um, as you've heard, I am today representing UGHL, the Austrian Society for a Humane End of Life. And this association was founded only five years ago. Back then, assistance in voluntary dying was a criminal offense in Austria. Uh, we then initiated and filed a constitutional complaint. And as a result, legislation was indeed changed. Uh, since the beginning of 22, so for just over two years, voluntary assisted dying is possible in Austria, but within a very narrow legal framework. So although we feel that this is a huge step forward towards self-determination at all stages of life, we feel that more have to follow in Austria and, of course, on an international level. We are a tiny country. We rely on numerous interactions with our neighbors. We enjoy the freedom to travel to and work in and live in any European country. So it does not make sense at all that legislation concerning end of life decisions should differ depending on where you are located at the time when you need it. And we therefore feel very strongly about harmonizing regulations across Europe and we fully support this petition that is being launched. And we do know that our values are shared by a large part of the population and also a number of public figures in Austria, such as the actress and TV presenter Chris Luna or the author Daniel Wisser and others have spoken out publicly about their belief in self-determination at the end of life. So clearly the time is ripe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi, for summarizing uh, your support to the petition. I will give now the floor to Jacqueline Herremans uh, from the Association pour le droit de mourir dans la dignité from Belgium. Uh, Jacqueline, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lorenzo, and uh, sorry for uh, the problem of the micro. Well, uh, it's settled. So I'm very lucky, I must say, to live in a country like uh, Belgium because uh, we have a law on patients' rights, we have a law on euthanasia. Patient right. well, uh, it's possible for uh, a Belgium citizen or, or a citizen living in Belgium uh, to... Uh, have the informed consent for every medical treatment, but also uh, to have the possibility to refuse a treatment and that in advance. So we have living wills uh, in uh, Belgium recognized by the law. Uh, and that's very important because, well, uh, the end of the life, that's a very important point. But before the end of life, we have to get this freedom of decide for ourselves uh, about medical treatments and to have this focus about self-determination along on life about medical treatments. Uh, about euthanasia, yes, we are lucky to get to have this law and not from you know uh, 
a short time. Uh, this law uh, was passed in 2002. So uh, we know a lot about the practice of euthanasia. It, it is possible in Belgium by lethal injection of by a, a, a syrup of barbiturates. So we must say that it's possible in Belgium, euthanasia and assisted suicide, in other words. But, well, that's the point that we have to stress. We received daily requests from citizens, not only from Europe, but, on low, uh, but also from the world, from South Korea, for, for example, from Australia. But, well, I remain in Europe. That's the most important point today. And do you know that last year, more than 100 citizens from France uh, well, uh, were able to benefit from our law on euthanasia, more than 100. But very, uh, very often we have to discourage uh, people requesting euthanasia in Belgium because we have to follow the law and it's not uh, so easy, you know, that's a road with uh, several uh, uh, programs on the road. So, uh, well, uh, for a citizen from abroad, it's not so easy to get euthanasia uh, in Belgium. And so that's the reason we really, uh, you know, support the, this idea that it would be possible in each country of Europe and thereafter in the world. Uh, and uh, one important step was the case uh, Mortier against uh, Belgium uh, in front of the Court of Human Rights of Strasbourg. And it was confirmed by the court that our Belgium law on euthanasia uh, well, uh, was uh, absolutely uh, conforming the uh, requirement of the Convention on Human Rights. That was an important step. That was the first time that the court has to pronounce uh, a decision uh, around a law on euthanasia. And we get it. Uh, that was the opponents. Uh, they introduced the request in front of the reopened court. Sorry for them, they lose. Uh, well, uh, so uh, we are supporting this idea that it would be possible in each country to get the right uh, to decide about the end of our life and also to have the right to decide about medical treatment. So the idea of, uh, for example, a, a open passport uh, about uh, living wills, that's very interesting. We have now develop ELs in different countries and also in Europe. So that's the, uh, should say, uh, the way to get uh, the possibility uh, to uh, have these living wills respect in each country of Europe. Thank you, Jacqueline, for your speech. Um, I will give now the floor to Ireland. Uh, and I will ask to Gianni Lazar, who's chair of End of Life, um, chair of End of Life Ireland, and Justin McKean, uh, McKenna, partners at Law LLP, and they can both summarize the situation in Ireland and also uh, why they support this petition. Uh, thank you, Jenny and Justin. The floor is your Jenny, and then you're free to speech to speak also, Justin. Lorenzo, thank you very much, and thank you to all of you here. There, there's a great unity when we all realise why we want legislation. I'd like to start from the absence of legislation that, if you like, the driving force for us is that we, we, we believe that nobody should have to travel for an assisted death. Nobody should have to endure prolonged suffering. The fact that somebody is dying or have, they have an incurable condition and their quality of life is unacceptable to them. And they're on a downward journey, if you like, towards their death, that their own country, they should be able to die in their own country 
at a time that they deem is right for them. To die alone by alternative means, to have to consider to take their lives by suicide, uh, to have to send off for drugs to do this, to have to curtail their life earlier to travel is, is unacceptable to us. So we, we're in the situation at the moment where we have no legislation. And what I will do now is to pass over to Justin to give you an update as to where we're at, one step in the journey. Thank you. Thank you, Janie. <clears throat> and uh, thank you all for this opportunity uh, to address this very important petition. The legal position in Ireland is that we're governed by the Suicide Act of 1993, in which it is a criminal offence to aid, abet, procure or cancel uh, a suicide. And the punishment is 14 years uh, in prison. After the passing of that act in 93, there were a number of cases introducing an element of compassion for those who were at the end of their lives. And it was decided in 2013 that the legislature in Ireland were free to introduce a law. In other words, the constitution didn't deny them the right to do so. That meant that it was not necessary to go to the people, that the state legislature could uh, introduce the law. Subsequent to that, we had the uh, United Nations Convention on the uh, Rights of uh, Persons with Disabilities. And that prompted the uh, that prompted the um, passing of the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act in 2015. Now it has taken eight years for that act to be implemented because of the changes that it brought about in our system here of management uh, of particularly mental health, and these protocols were determined uh, and. Uh, an Office of Decision Support Service established to enable people uh, to make decisions when they've lost capacity. The point about that is that it also introduced the concept of a living will, the right to make an advanced health care decision, the idea that one could, uh, at the end of life, determine what would be uh, the best way to die, but in a restrictive sense, in other words, that it could only determine what should not be done, such as resuscitation or artificial feeding or ventilation. Then uh, in 2020, we had a private members bill introduced to the uh, Irish Parliament, uh, the Dignity with Dying bill, and it was debated and decided it should go to committee. Uh, the committee uh, that subsequently was put together to, to debate and discuss this uh, topic uh, sat for nine months from last year and has delivered its report just last week. And the uh, committee report uh, is 91 pages in length with 38 uh, recommendations. And uh, they have uh, determined that, uh, it, or they have recommended that the law be changed to enable uh, assisted dying. So there have been, there have been wonderful uh, uh, movements forward in uh, preparing Ireland for the next step. And in September of this year, uh, Ireland will be hosting the, uh, the conference uh, for the Federation uh, uh, of World Right to Die Societies. Um, and that, that will be happening here in Dublin uh, this coming September. So that brings you up to date with the position as we have it in Ireland. Uh, so thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you, Justin. And thank you, Jenny, also. Um, now the last two panelists uh, from the conference, and uh, then we open uh, the mic for questions uh, and uh, consideration also to journalists. Um, we will give you the floor now to Yvette Schwit from the Dutch Right to Die Society from Netherlands. Thank you, Lorenzo, and good morning, everyone. Um, I didn't have much time to prepare, so I'll just do my best. But um, yeah, as we all know, uh, the Netherlands was the first country in Europe to uh, um, yeah to have a euthanasia law. I think 
in headlines is kind of the same system as for Belgium. Um, so in the Netherlands, euthanasia by lethal injection or assisted suicide by the drink is possible. Uh, so the legal framework is quite similar. Um, our association, the NPVE, was founded in 1973, and it took us 30 years to act to uh, advocate for uh, the euthanasia law we have nowadays. And uh, we find it very important that not only in the Netherlands, in Belgium and other European countries, there is a possibility to die with dignity, but we find that it should be able for all European citizens and one day for all citizens uh, worldwide. So we advocate for more self-determination self and awareness. And um, that's why we support this initiative. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Yvette. And now we have the, the last speech of this conference. Then we will, uh, as I said, open the mic for questions. So I already have in the chat one, uh, one question. Um, the floor is yours, Claude Uri. Uh, we will give you the floor in French. We know that uh, there is still this competition among French and English for the official language uh, within the, the EU and in international relations. So uh, the, uh, on te donnera la parole en français, Claude Uri, uh, de Ultima Liberté, pour présenter, Claude, uh, votre adhésion à la pétition et uh, la situation légale uh, en France sur le sujet de fin de vie. Claude, the, your microphone, you should open the microphone. Okay. Okay, Claude, we, we can't hear, on peut pas t'entendre, tu devrais uh, ouvrir le microphone. Uh, tu devrais retenter à nouveau, Claude. Ah. Voilà. C'est bon. <rire> euh, Aujourd'hui, euh, il y a une euh, avancée importante au niveau de la France. Pour la première fois, on va parler d'aide à mourir. Le président dépose un projet de loi au niveau de l'Assemblée, euh, des assemblées, pour enfin avoir dans la loi le terme « aide à mourir ». Aujourd'hui, toute aide à mourir est illégale. Nous sommes poursuivis, d'ailleurs, auprès des tribunaux pour avoir informer nos adhérents de la possibilité d'obtenir du pacte du Nambutan. Ce qui est important, je pense, dans la pétition que, évidemment, nous avons signée, c'est que, enfin, on puisse, au niveau européen, Essayer d'avoir une communauté, euh, une possibilité pour les, les ressortissants d'avoir une loi, peut-être de choisir la loi qui leur convient si dans leur pays, cette loi, ne, la loi du pays ne leur convient pas. C'est très difficile hein, à obtenir, je pense. Euh, la loi proposée exclut les mineurs, toutes les maladies neurodégénératives, les maladies psychiatriques, les personnes âgées. Que reste-t-il comme malades qui vont pouvoir être aidés éventuellement à mourir J'ai lu euh, dans la traduction de la pétition le droit des individus de décider par quels moyens et à quel moment leur vie prendra fin. 
Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas de conditions Est-ce qu'il faut être malade euh, Est-ce que c'est euh, volontairement que ça n'a pas été précisé dans la pétition C'est une, une réflexion euh, que je fais. Voilà euh, un petit peu euh, et nous, nous sommes euh, beaucoup euh, écoutés en ce moment dans les médias parce que euh, il y a des cas qui vont en Belgique, des personnes qui vont en Suisse, qui médiatisent leur euh, passage dans les États euh, limitrophes et euh, et puis, il y a ce procès qui arrive, peut-être d'ici la fin de l'année. Donc, euh, ça nous fait à chaque fois une tribune pour exprimer euh, nos, euh, nos pensées, nos demandes et nos, on va pas dire, revendications. Euh, voilà. Euh, ce que j'ai à dire de la situation actuellement en France. Euh, j'ai lu qu'il y avait peut-être une possibilité de convention. En France, nous avons eu une convention citoyenne sur la fin de vie qui a été très euh, intéressante, euh, très, très intéressante, puisque... Euh, il s'avère que 75% des personnes qui participaient à la convention, c'est-à-dire 183, je crois, ont toutes voté, entre guillemets, pour une aide à mourir. Et il y a 22% dans ces 75 qui ont voté pour une aide active, une aide à mourir, quel que soit l'état de santé de la personne. Ce qui pour nous est très intéressant, parce que c'est encore dans la proposition de loi faite par M. Macron, c'est encore le médecin qui va décider avec le court terme, le moyen terme. C'est vraiment insupportable. J'ai dit. Ok, merci Claude, merci beaucoup pour ta considération. Euh, avant euh, de, voilà, je vois déjà Marco qui a, uh, I will uh, now switch to English, sorry, my brain was in a French mood, and so I will give now the floor to Marco, uh, and then we go to the question also uh, from journalists, I see one question in the chat. So Marco, the floor is yours. Uh, I just wanted to reply to the question answered by Claude Uri uh, um, regarding the fact that we did not uh, uh, insert, we, don't, we did not put the conditions uh, um, to be considered in order to uh, allow the access to voluntary assisted dying. In reality, um, when we talk about uh, um, the Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights, we are talking about general principles. So we did just quote um, the um, we did just quote the what the European Court of Human Rights decided. Um, without specifying at which condition, because this is uh, a matter to be regulated by national legislation. So um, we think it's uh, better do not pretend that uh, the, the, the law are exactly the same uh, around Europe, but the, the principle the general principle is accepted as a fundamental human right. And then every and each country will set the limit and condition in their proper way, but uh, uh, without uh, uh, accepting 
the total prohibition as a solution. So uh, this is uh, the narrow path that we followed between the fact that uh, the penal law is a, a competence for national states. So uh, the European Union cannot directly legislate on penal law, but can legislate on general human rights principles and put them in the Charter of Fundamental Human Rights. Something similar, for example, is uh, applied for the proposal of having abortion in the Charter of Human Rights. This the European Parliament asked for, uh, the French uh, president also asked for. This does not mean to have the same law on abortion in every European country, but to have the general principle are accepted as a fundamental right, and then is a competence for national state to legislate. So this is uh, why we did not specify the uh, conditions um, related to this uh, human rights that we wanted to be approved at the European level. Thank you, Marco. And now we have a first question from uh, Nina Sankari, chief editor at the Ateis Review from Poland. Uh, her question is, if uh, this petition is successful, but Poland still does not adopt the dying indignity law, Will it be easier to obtain in another European country where it's legal? Thank you. Um, I see that someone, Justin, has tried to answer this question. I don't know if, Marco, you want to go first and answering and then... Jacqueline just... also. Jacqueline also. So, so I will give the floor to maybe Justin first and then Jacqueline. Thank you, uh, Lorenzo. Uh, I'd be brief. The position in Ireland uh, will be a matter of law when it's introduced. And the recommendation, as we have it from last week's report, is that um, the law, as it will apply here, um, if the recommendation is to be followed, will be confined to Irish citizens or persons with a permanent residence in Ireland. Um, that is the position at the moment, but the law as yet has not been enacted. Um, and uh, I will uh, hand over to Jacqueline now. She may speak from the Belgian experience. Well, in Belgium, uh, you know, when we thought about this law uh, at the beginning of this uh, century, we didn't uh, think about our, well, I will quote, uh, tourism. Tunisia tourism. And so there is no requirement in the law about, you know, you have to be a citizen of Belgium or of you have to live in Belgium for a while. No, there is not such requirements. And I see that in the law uh, which are passed uh, uh, after in Spain, maybe in France, maybe in Ireland, <laughs> I find all the time this requirement only citizens or people living for a while in the country. Well, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I will not say that's uh, uh, foolish about these countries. Uh, they try to avoid to have to answer to a request from abroad, okay? That was not our uh, point of view in Belgium. So uh, even if it's difficult, uh, we welcome uh, citizens from abroad. It's much more difficult, much more for, uh, difficult. And uh, Nina, if I may say, yes, uh, we have, uh, 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 there are requests from citizens from Hungary, from uh, Poland, from, uh, from Austria sometimes, from Germany and so on. Uh, so we it's we try to answer to their request but tomorrow it's going to be more and more difficult uh, to get access to euthanasia laws uh, in uh, new countries should i say uh, when i see uh, the law the project of law in france you know i have to 
well, to smile because it's, uh, I don't know if uh, there are so many citizens in Europe, uh, certainly not Belgium, really uh, would want to go to France to uh, go to this slow, uh, well, it says, uh, with all this restriction uh, in France. But well, uh, yes, that yeah. was the idea of the president. No, no, no citizen from abroad. Okay. Um, okay, I will add the formal answer to the Nina Sankari question. Um, if uh, the European Union uh, recognize uh, one day or another uh, the um, voluntary assisted dying as a fundamental human right, this doesn't mean from a formal imme immediate point of view that it would be easier to obtain in another European country um voluntary assisted dying but the indirect effect could be uh that if this uh, european legislation pa will pass one day then it would influence national legislations and then it would be probably easier to obtain in another european country um, voluntary assisted dying. So it's not a direct, it would not be a direct formal consequence, but it could be an indirect uh, consequence because of the influence uh, that European legislation will have on national legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Marco, for answering. And now I will say this is the last appeal for question because uh, we are closing the conference, but if there is any last question, I don't see hands from participants. Okay. So uh, as we said at the beginning, uh, we will send you the link to this conference so that you can use it with your own press content. We'd also, we will also send you a press release uh, with the um, results of the press conference so that you can, uh, if you wish, translate and spread uh, out uh, to your own uh, press contacts. And uh, uh, I would like also to, um, to send you in the chat the link um, of the, because we published the petition on the web so that uh, uh, if somebody wants to uh, sign the petition, can do it uh, this link. You are also free to uh, put the petition in your own uh, website of your own organization, if you wish, and then, and then we share the results. And uh, I encourage, uh, I sent you the link to the, um, for the possibility to sign the petition. I encourage you to collect signature for from prominent personalities in your own country so that maybe in a one month or a, before the European election, we can have a public update of the support that we obtain to the petition uh, so that we can reinforce the pressure to European Parliament and to the European Parliament candidates for next European election. So this will be um, a, a type of activity that it's very important to do. So uh, we consider this uh, moment, this press conference, not as the final step of the process, but more or as a first step of a process of pressure um, to the EU institution for the coming weeks and months. So. Thank you very much for attending and uh, see you very soon. And there is also this very important appointment in Ireland in September that was mentioned. So we will have uh, other occasion online or in person to join forces to our common goal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye.